Okay, so let's have a look at some actual examples now. So we're starting off with question three. It's a floor question so, uh, of the argument. So in order to find this, remember main conclusion and argument, you have to clearly identify so you know what you're working with. So we're looking at the case of a supermarket using plastic bags with their fruit and vegetables, and they want to replace them with compostable bags. So that's just what they're introducing. What's this going to do? Well, this is going to save this many plastic bags, which is this much plastic, and it's going to make it the first nationwide chain to remove them. Here's the argument against it now, however, there are problems with the compostable bags that will replace the plastic ones. This plan to replace plastic bags should be opposed, so the main conclusion is that. So let's just summarise what we're looking at here. We've got plastic bags versus compostable. We're basically saying um, compostable bags will, uh, there are problems with it, therefore we should oppose it. Um, I hope that this is clear to you that this is that argument that we had before. If they haven't considered both sides, basically, you can't, by arguing that there's a problem with A, say that B is therefore the answer. So it hasn't balanced it enough. We have to look at, is there an argument? We, the flaw would be that the argument has not considered which one will be worse, basically. So A, it does not establish that saving 500 tonnes of plastic a year will not be beneficial. Um, that doesn't, again, that's not really... Um, uh, that's not really the point because we want them to more balance plastic bags and compostable and overall which one is going to give the net benefit as opposed to, of course they have mentioned this, but you know, they haven't, this isn't arguing the other side then, this is still on the topic for compostable bags. Um, considers only one alternative as plastic bags, that doesn't really matter because we are arguing one versus another right now. Um, compostable bags can be used for the same range, this is more of an assumption point or maybe, uh, yeah, basically. I mean, you can tell that in the language right here, it assumes. Um, it fails to show that the problems associated with compostable bags would not be, would be as severe as those associated with plastic. So yeah, this is the one that we want. Um, it's looking at, um, we have, they haven't considered all the problems with compostable as much of an issue because they have to look at both sides of the argument, basically. So this one's quite a nice and simple one. Probably this wouldn't have tripped off a lot of you anyway. Okay, so we've got a weakens the argument question here. So in order to do this one, again, we need main conclusion, we need argument, and you want to kind of see an exemplification of whatever the flaw would be. So let's have a look. So the mobile phone was said to be the ultimate liberating device rather than being forced to stay not just inside a house, not just in a particular room, da, da, da. you can go anywhere to talk to someone. The irony is that mobile fire and phones have made us a lot less mobile, not only are we more sedentary than ever before, but evidence suggests we now spend longer indoors than we did before mobile phones became prevalent. We should rename our beloved devices in mobile phones. Why would we feel the need to go anywhere after all if we can obtain all the information we need and communicate with anyone we want from the comfort of our homes? So this is really the kind of conclusion, I guess. We should rename our uh, beloved devices in mobile phones, the argument being, I mean, you can see the flaw here quite clearly, I hope, we're saying that there is a trend in mobile phone users going up. At the same time, we're becoming more sedentary. Um, so the, the weakness here will either be that the sedentary perhaps comes first and it causes the mobile phone use to go up, or there is a third factor that is causing both of them to trend upwards that is nothing to do with um, either being related to the other. So we'll just look for that in here. So A, not everyone owns a mobile phone. Doesn't really matter. Um, there are other sorts of tech-sized phones through which people can communicate effectively. That's just, again, hopefully you can see that this is just additional pointless information. When people use their phones to help monitor their physical activity in the hope that it will get them to exercise. Well, that's not the point because the argument we're making is that uh, mobile phones are making us more sedentary, so it's unrelated. People may want to leave their homes for reasons other than communicate. Again, that doesn't, that's not related to the argument we're trying to um, weaken. And then people who do not own mobile phones exhibit the same trend towards spending longer indoors. So this is, if this were identified a flaw question, it would have said something along the lines of, um, there may be another reason explaining both trends. Now that it's a weakness, we want to uh, have an actual something related to this extract here. And so if you have um, people who don't own phones exhibiting the same trend towards spending longer inside, then we know there is a third factor C that is causing both um, the sedentary lifestyle and the mobile phone use, or maybe completely unrelated. And we're saying there's another factor that is responsible for making us sedentary, and then separate reasons while we're using mobile phones. So they just happen to be happening together, which is uh, most likely the case. Okay, so now another flaw question here. Um, again, main conclusion, argument, and then identify what the flaw could be. The intensive farming, which is gonna give greatest food yield per hectare, is widely believed to create higher levels of pollution and damage. 
uh, than organic farming. So again, we're looking at two um, things here, comparing them, guessing which one's better maybe. But the reality is the opposite is the case. So in this case, we're saying, I'm guessing organic farming is worse than the intensive, um, measured by externalities, environmental costs such as greenhouse gas emission, fertilizer, water use, etc. Da, 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 on both high yield and low yield farms. In its study of dairy farming in Switzerland, it found that high yield systems were actually less damaging to the environment than organic, which by contrast took up twice as much land for the same volume of milk. Da, 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 da. Okay, so hopefully you can recognize this as being, you cannot just use one example to explain an answer, it, because this is the bulk of the argument, right? So if you look before, none of this is argument, it's just introducing a topic and then it's giving the main conclusion, right? Um, and then the argument, as I said, if you've looked at some of my main conclusion videos, you'll know, this is now the argument, right? But the argument is entirely based on this study. So it's fine if the argument comes out first and then Switzerland comes out to support it, or it's fine if it talks about multiple different places and the place itself doesn't matter for the argument. But in this case, it is completely reliant on Switzerland. So looking through, it's this one, okay? So it, you need to identify where the argument's coming from and then see if it's appropriate in that particular case. Let's do the same thing again. So the dark tendencies, humans may have such a psychopathy, uh, psychopathy, psychopathy, narcissism, egoism, da, 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 our underlying source, uh, based on the same underlying source, maximizing one individual interest and to disregard or malevolently cause harm to others' interests. Okay, so all of this is so far STEM. These tendencies often underlie the most serious violent crime in any society, usually dealt with by imprisonment. Um, again, all of this is STEM. Now we're going to get into the argument and perhaps the conclusion. So psychiatrists say that people with these characteristics are notoriously difficult to change. This suggests that these personality traits, so this suggests, tells us this is the argument now, um, are likely to be inherited genetic dis uh, dispositions over which people have no control. It is wrong, okay, here's our conclusion, therefore, to punish people for the actions that have resulted from such tendencies. The justice system should not imprison someone for actions over which they have no control. So, we're basically saying, the argument is being that um, psychopathy and everything is genetic, people don't have a control over it, uh, therefore we shouldn't punish people for that, and therefore the main conclusion being the justice system should not imprison someone. Um, you can see that there's a clear, you can look at this in two ways. Number one, you can look at it as um, the point I made where it doesn't quite match. So the punishing people has to, after this sentence, there has to be another sentence that says all prison sentences punish people or something like that. Uh, so you can look at it as having not having jumped from A, B to D, or you could look at it as having uh, something where imprisoning someone is not the same as punishing someone. And you can say that the two have been used interchangeably when they shouldn't have been. So either one will be fine. So we'll just look at the options to see which it would be. So it fails to sort of show the research on which, okay, so this is one of those things where this is rarely the answer, again, unless the argument is based entirely upon what the psychiatrist says. So be careful about that one. Um, ignores differences in punishments between countries, doesn't matter. Uh, implies that imprisonment is the only option, um, doesn't matter. Uh, it suggests that ways of altering uh, serious antisocial behaviour can never be found. Again, that doesn't matter. We're trying to argue about the wrongness of a certain thing. We're trying to argue about the wrongness of um, prison, uh, of uh, something, imprisoning pe something, people for something they have no control over. Assumes that the only objective imprisonment is punishment. That would be the one because um, this is explaining that we're equating imprisonment and punishment together. When this is obviously not going to be the case, there's a lot of what well, the purpose of imprisonment, I suppose, is more rehabilitation, but uh, how successful that is, is neither here nor there. The point of it is that you can't jump from one to the other. This would only make sense if there are a sentence in between that said the purpose of imprisonment is punishment or something along those lines. Um, so, again, when you're uh, looking through this, make sure you're only the floor, when you're looking for the floor, make sure that you're only looking at the argument sentences. Don't be looking at the stem part because that's, the, the stem part doesn't show the, uh, the, the floor. That would only be something where maybe an assumption's taking place. You can look for assumptions there, but never the flaw or the weakness, okay? So most weakens. Um, so surely there can be few things more commendable than donating to charity, yet there are many reasons to rethink charitable models uh, for tackling social problems. 
Relying on voluntary public donations to fund charitable work can lead less important but popular causes without support they require. For instance, many people are willing to donate to charities, assisting cancer patients or neglected animals and to those helping drug addicts, whatever. Uh, also, in some countries, the largest donors are wealthy individuals given tax reductions in exchange for their charitable donations. Such tax breaks reduce the government revenue, meaning they have less money to fund a more comprehensive public service approach to addressing society's problems. So first of all, the conclusion um, is going to be um, yet this part uh, is really it's kind of mixed in throughout, isn't it? But um, yeah, so the, the main idea is that we need to rethink um, the charitable model that we use for tackling the social problems. And the reason for that is that number one, people donate to less popular causes. Uh, and then number two, uh, to only the causes that they want. And then number two, it's to do with this uh, tax break stuff, which means that the government money is reduced. And so um, we can't use government methods to uh, address society's problems. The important two parts are that we shouldn't necessarily use charities to tackle society's problems. Um, first, it reduces the government's ability to tackle problems. And second, not all social problems would be addressed as a result, okay? So in terms of weakening this argument, I suppose you could say we've only focused, again, from that list, I'm trying to fit it in because I think it's easier to think about, but I think from that list, what it fits best is that it only considers the kind of weaknesses, the bad parts of the charity. And again, it hasn't given a balanced enough argument. You can't come simply to a conclusion that something is not a good idea purely because it has some bad points. We don't know the overall picture here. So that would be the weakness of that, an exemplification of that we're looking for. So maybe something along the lines of charities are good or other methods are bad or something like that. So many non-wealthy taxpayers would prefer to give money to charities of their own choosing rather than, I mean, that was literally, that doesn't matter. Charities are often better than governments at testing innovative approaches that make a significant difference to tackling social problems. Here we go. So that one is now considering the other side of the argument. Number of charitable organisations much higher in the world. Nope, some people in real need of uh, more assistance are reluctant to accept help from charities. That doesn't matter as well because we're trying to tackle social problems. Individual cases like that would not sufficiently weaken this argument. And money donated would be spent on administrative costs rather than on causes they meant to help. This would actually strengthen the argument because we're saying charities are the problem. So using that template can actually be a really, really useful thing, I hope, for you because I know people do struggle with these um, questions. Um, let's look here, conclusion. Um, okay, I think this might be the last one. So, a charity dealing with, floor question, a charity dealing with homelessness has reported its caseworkers have compiled a list of private landlords and rental companies which have refused to undertake necessary repairs to properties. Again, split off anything not very useful. In some of those cases, tenants have been evicted simply for complaining about the conditions in which they were living. Acting unjustly towards vulnerable people in these ways is an abuse of power. We do have an opinion in here. Tenants, therefore, so the arguments they've done, tenants, therefore, need to be protected from individuals and commercial companies which profit from owning and letting properties. So, what is the result? Only not-for-profit housing associations should be allowed to let accommodation to people who cannot afford to buy their homes. So. Some companies are being unfair to tenants uh, who are vulnerable, this is abuse, therefore we need to make sure that only uh, not-for-profit housing associations are letting the properties. Really similar to the last one that we just had, but that was a weakness one, but they really haven't considered that there first of all could be um, good things about the private companies or that there could be bad things about other options. So again, we've drawn a conclusion based on that we think um, uh, necessary because we've got these bad elements that all of it will be bad and that definitely the other solution will be better it's just too much of a jump so the tenants who were evicted may have been unsatisfactory that's not part of the argument people who rent accommodation are not necessary it doesn't matter either harsh penalties for abusive landlords will not necessarily be effective again it's suggesting another opinion i suppose on how we can deal with it but it's not focusing on the actual flaw in the argument um, some people who could afford to buy their homes may definitely not not-for-profit housing associations may be no better than commercial companies or private landlords. So there we go. That is precisely what we want from the template that I gave you. Um, I'm pretty sure that's the last one. Okay, so I hope that was somewhat helpful for you. Um, again, I just want to make really, really clear 
that the only way to find the weakness and flaw correctly is if you only focus on the argument language. The moment you get distracted by the statistics or the numbers, something that doesn't make up the argument, then you're going to get confused. So use the same structure of identify the stem, identify the main conclusion, identify the argument, put it in different colours or split it off. I like to use these kind of things to split it off if that is helpful. And then focusing on that, try to fit it into one of the general flaws first. And if that doesn't work, it's probably quite a unique one that you just want to have a careful look at the actual makeup of that argument. But most of the time, I'd say 80 to 90% of the time, one of those general template ones will work for you. Okay, so I hope that was helpful and um, I will see you in the next video.